Hi, and good evening. Thank you for joining us. My name is Liz Larder. I'm Congresswoman Strickland's District Director. Um, thank you for all joining us for this evening's town hall about housing. Um, before we get started, just a little couple housekeeping things. We are gonna be taking um, questions during this town hall and we're gonna take some live questions on the back half of it. So please submit your questions through the Q&A and our team will get back to you. And now it is my pleasure to turn it over to my boss, the wonderful Congresswoman Marilyn Strickland. Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight for our virtual town hall meeting, which is focusing on housing. I have two very special guests with expertise and this is going to be a great discussion. And tonight's discussion is really about you, the residents of the 10th Congressional District of Washington State that I proudly represent. And we just wanna make sure that we are able to interact with you, let you know what we've been working on and also hear from you as well and answer some questions. Coincidentally, both President Biden and Governor Inslee today have announced some news about housing and we'll talk about that later. And it's also important too, for you to understand what I've been working on in addition to housing. So I'll share that with you as well. Now it's been about 170 days since I was sworn in and it's been an interesting 170 days. And in some cases it feels like two years because there's so much work that we've been doing. And I wanna dive into some of that work as well. As I promised when I ran for office, I wanted to focus on the safety, health, and well-being of the residents of the 10th district in Washington state. And we have worked very hard to get as many vaccines into the arms of people who need them. We're also making sure that as we look at the American Rescue Plan, that we are improving vaccine distribution. We have provided over $300 million of pandemic relief in our district alone. And I'm fighting to improve the health of our ecosystem, our natural environment. I was so proud to work with my colleague, Congressman Derek Kilmer, and get the Puget Sound SOS Act passed out of the House. It's now in the Senate. And it really respects the fact that we live in a growing region the Puget Sound, which is the largest estuary by volume in the United States, is a precious resource. It's an ecosystem. It has a tribal history. It's part of our economic opportunity and development. And we want to make sure that we're preserving it and keeping it clean for generations to come. My second focus has also been on equitable prosperity. As we look at recovering from this pandemic, we want to make sure that everyone is included in the recovery. And that's why I was proud to fight so hard for small businesses, those especially owned by women and minorities, and ensuring that we are doing what we can to put money into local government. And that's why I fought for $350 billion of local aid that went to state government, tribal nations, and cities across the entire country. One of the first things I did when I got to Congress was provided an amendment to the National Apprenticeship Act. And that was a bipartisan effort that really recognizes that if we're going to make these big investments in infrastructure, we have to have the workforce and apprenticeships represent a path to getting a skilled trade and coming out without a lot of debt. The amendment that I added actually ensured that we were reaching out to traditionally underserved communities when it comes to apprenticeships, minorities, women, young people coming out of foster care to ensure that if we're making these big investments, that prosperity is shared and everyone has an opportunity to get access to a good job. And then finally, I'll talk a bit about the lives and livelihoods of the men and women who serve at JBLM and veterans as well. In the 10th Congressional District, we have the ninth largest population of veterans in the country. And we wanna make sure that those who are fighting to protect us and keep us safe, and those who have done so, have access to the services that they need. That includes everything from addressing military hunger, housing, ensuring that they get access to contraceptives and all the things that we know so many people deserve and need because they have fought hard for our country. And all three of these priorities have a common thread, housing. We have to make sure that people's basic needs are met. And we know that we live in one of the fastest growing regions in the entire country. People are discovering how amazing and special the South Sound is. But it also means that we have to make sure that people who live there are not getting priced out and that when new people move in, we have an adequate supply of housing. Housing is a very complicated issue, and that's why I'm honored to be joined tonight by two experts who know something about housing. So I'm going to start by introducing our guests here, and we want to talk a bit about what they're working on, how we're working together. And I want to start by introducing Craig Chance 
and he is the executive director of the Housing Authority of Thurston County that serves over 5,000 members of our community. And he's gonna talk about some of the programs that are going on in Thurston County. We also have tonight, Sarah, who's the vice president for public policy at the National Low Income Housing Coalition here. And she's gonna talk about how we build back better, smarter, how we work with renters and how we help make sure that our most marginalized communities get access to housing. And for those who are not familiar with the National Low Income Housing Coalition, for nearly 50 years, they have continued to fight for decent, affordable housing for all people. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. And I'm gonna turn this over to Craig right now who's gonna do an introduction of the work that he does. Craig? Well, thank you, Congressman. And we're really fortunate in our district to have a member of Congress who understands the issues and has a passion for it. Not true in every district in America. So it is indeed a blessing for our community to have a person like yourself representing us on these issues. You know, I think the work of the Housing Authority was summed up late last year, early this year by one of the folks we were able to help. She's a person in her 50s. She has some disabilities. And just really sadly, she had been enduring in a tent for three years. Mm -hmm. So with one of the voucher programs, a HUD subsidy program, we were able to get her into housing. And a few days later, she asked this question rhetorically to us. She said, you know, what's the best thing about my apartment? I don't know what's the best thing about your apartment. And she said, it has a toilet. And she said, that makes me feel like a human being again. I feel like a human being again. And so it's that respect, the dignity, and the hope that these programs give so that people can move forward in their lives. But it's just so sad we have people in those conditions. The voucher program assists in our community about 20, about 2,000 households, 2,000 households. And that's wonderful. But if we're typical of the nation, it's probably serving about 25% of the income eligible people. It's not set up like the food stamp program, SNAP is an entitlement. And so it doesn't serve as many people as it should. And we have people like that neighbor who is enduring in the tent. Um, fortunately, we'd seen some activity in Congress, thank you, um, that is increasing the funding for the voucher program, but that's why it's so, so important so that people can have that dignity. We also own housing units. We own 537 housing units that are all below market rate and serve a bit of a mixed income community, but it's kind of an opportunity for people who aren't fortunate enough to have a voucher, they can often afford that. We focus on people who are about 60% of median or less within our voucher holders. These are folks that are predominantly like 85% at 30% or less. And those are a lot of math numbers, but what does 30% of median mean in our community? Well, that's a person who very likely works at the grocery store, the person who helps us every day at the grocery store, an essential worker, as we've come to learn uh, during the pandemic. We also provide subsidy to nine different nonprofits to pay rental expenses within buildings they're, they're using. It, we call it collaborative housing. HUD's term is project-based vouchers. And that helps support another 475 housing units. And those nine profits focus on people with special needs. It might be behavioral health, it might be chronically homeless, it might be veterans who have suffered far too long in homelessness and now have stable homes. And we also provide supportive services. But I think as we do all this, we just keep in mind what that woman told us at the beginning of the year to, to provide people that, that dignity, that respect and that hope. And we really appreciate all the support that Congresswoman Strickland is able to give to that effort. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, please introduce yourself. Hi, it's um, so great to be here with you, Congresswoman. Thank you. Uh, I'm Sarah Sadian. I'm Vice President of Public Policy at the National Low Income Housing Coalition. And I have to just echo Craig's remarks that it's so great to have a new champion on affordable housing in Congress. Uh, we need more folks like you who are passionate about this issue and are fighting uh, every day to help um, advance the cause. Um, the work that we do is really focused on the lowest income and most marginalized renters in America, those families who are paying 50, 60, 70% of their income on rent. Uh, they aren't getting any assistance from the federal government um, for the reasons that Craig mentioned, and they end up struggling to pay rent, put food on the table, make ends meet. And uh, far too many times, those are the folks who are falling behind on their rent. They might face eviction. 
they might lose their home, and in worst cases, they become homeless. So a lot of the work that we've done during this pandemic has been to focus on this really urgent crisis that's facing our communities where you know, 6 million renter households are behind on their rent. Uh, so we're working hard to, to track emergency rental assistance programs, put out best practices, work with Treasury to make that program as successful as possible. But we're also focused on the long-term solutions because we know there was a housing crisis long before this pandemic. And uh, it's really important that we're building the political will for the solutions that are needed at the scale that's needed. And I'm so glad to be here today to talk about this once in a lifetime opportunity that we have with President Biden and Secretary Fudge. They're both deeply committed to, like the Congresswoman, to, uh, to build more affordable housing. And uh, I'm hoping that we can make that possible this year. Thank you, Sarah. Great, thank you, Sarah, Congresswoman and Craig. We are going to open it up to our Q&A. So um, we received a ton of great questions and we're also trying to save some, some time for live questions. So for those of you that at home that submitted questions, thank you so much. We appreciate your, your time and your inputs. However, we did get some similar questions. So we have consolidated down again, just for time's sake. And if your question um, wasn't answered or you don't feel like it was answered fully, please reach out to us. You can reach out to us via the Congresswoman's website, which is strickland.house.gov. So Congresswoman, the first question is for you. Um, it is a question from Wayne. It is kind of a multi-part question. So bear with me um, okay. as I read it. And if you want me to repeat anything, just let me know. Okay. So uh, he had a couple questions on the housing bill. Um, which transit areas does your housing bill focus on? Like what types of units? Does it, um, what type of infrastructure? So trains, buses. Um, he's also wondering how does your um, transit oriented development bill differentiate from other previous programs that have to deal with housing homeless that might be more effective? Um, and then he's also, wondering how do you foresee kind of this additional housing affecting property prices in Pierce County, Tacoma, South Sound area. Um, and then kind of lastly, he's wondering, isn't housing truly a local issue and why does it matter that the federal government gets involved? Well, Wayne, thank you for that question. It already looks like you know a lot about housing. And the bill he's referring to is the one that I co-sponsored, which is the Build More Housing Near Transit Act. I serve on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. And what we're doing in that committee is looking at housing as infrastructure, affordable housing and low-income housing as infrastructure. And so in that act, whenever transit agencies do large investments and build-outs, they often apply to the federal government for grants. And so they can be small starts grants or another type of grant. And if the project is at least $300 million in value, we want to incentivize transit agencies to actually do studies near where they're building out transit, typically light rail, bus rapid transit, to ensure that if they're making that investment, that they're taking housing into consideration. For so long in this country, we have never thought about housing and transportation as things that go together. And in many cases, because we were so about automobiles and cars, we have patterns of housing and land use decisions that we're trying to undo now with better mass transit for all people. And so that's one of the things we're trying to do as far as like, you know, how this bill would work. You know, if we want to increase density, we need multifamily housing. And so it is my hope that we're building more apartments, more condos, and more ways for a larger number of people to have close proximity to transit so that they can get to work, get to school and have their basic needs met. As we look at the housing crisis too, you raise a good question, Wayne, about, you know, should this be a local issue? And as a former mayor, I can tell you unequivocally that local land use rules are the biggest barrier to adding more housing. So if we think about incentivizing local government to do a better job of zoning, we can try and get more housing built. And my bill doesn't necessarily touch directly on assistance for folks who are experiencing homelessness, but we also know that that is a very complicated, multifaceted issue. Yes, we need more housing, but it needs to be permanent supportive housing, often with wraparound services. And unfortunately, you know, Washington state has one of the lowest investments in mental health and behavioral health. So that could be a topic on its own. So my bill doesn't exactly address the homeless situation and the help that a lot of folks need, but adding more housing 
is definitely good for people of all income levels and it helps alleviate some of the challenges that we have when it comes down to the supply of housing. Thank you, Congresswoman. So Sarah, this next question is from you. It's from our constituent, Patricia. She is wondering what is being done to address the extreme lack of low income housing for seniors. Family housing does not meet our special needs such as no stairs and parking close to apartment. Uh, and she's also wondering, there's, you know, many in that population have health issues usually mean they need to live in a more quiet environment, which only he, senior housing would give. That's a really great question. I want to get to that, but I also want to just tout the Congresswoman's bill for a second too. One of the things I love about her um, Build Housing New York Transit Act is that it breaks down these silos that have been existing for such a long time between the transit agencies and housing. You know, they, when they work together, they work best because that means that there are more riders to ride on that transportation. And it means that riders are closer to that. They can get to work easier. But for so long, transit agencies and housing agencies weren't necessarily working together that way. So I really want to applaud her for thinking outside the box and making that connection there. In terms of senior housing, I uh, absolutely, seniors are uh, one of the groups that have some of the greatest needs right now. What we've seen is that the very poorest seniors, the very poorest households uh, that include people with disabilities face additional challenges when it comes to finding affordable housing. Of course, they have to find something that's affordable, but also they find a lot of trouble finding homes that are accessible to their needs, right? As we age, we need additional modifications perhaps to keep uh, to age in our homes or age in place. People with disabilities often need housing to be built that's accessible to them, but there's really a lot of difficulty finding that housing supply. So what I'm looking forward to is the um, this infrastructure bill that Congress might be passing. Um, we've been, there's a lot of conversation about bipartisan bills and a larger economic recovery bill, but either way, we're hoping that really robust investments in affordable housing are included in that. And when we make those investments, we can ensure that they are built in a way that is affordable and accessible to everyone who needs it. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. So this next question is for the Congresswoman. Uh, Congresswoman, we had a couple of constituents, um, Diana, Joel, and Lorena, who wrote in about the cost of rent. Um, one of the questions that was written in was, you know, <laughs> rents in South Sound are outrageous. As you know, Congresswoman, this has been flagged for you a lot, how much rent has increased in the South Sound. Um, and that, you know, anybody who makes less than $20,000 a year cannot really afford anything on their own. And then we have, high, as you know, you know, Congresswoman in Washington State, we have a high sales tax, and they're just feeling like they're getting pinched and pinched. And they're wondering, what are you and the rest of Congress doing to help Americans like them? Absolutely. Well, thank you for that question. And it is a challenge. And again, as our population continues to grow and the housing supply does not keep up with demand, it's only going to get difficult to find housing and to keep it affordable. And so, you know, one thing that I wanted to share with you, and I talked about this earlier in my introduction, is that the Biden administration today extended the nationwide ban on evictions for at least a month. And this is going to help millions of tenants who are unable to make rent payments during this pandemic. Governor Inslee today also announced the extension of the emergency on evictions through the end of September. So those are two things that are going to help folks. And I recently signed on to a letter to leadership of the House of Representatives supported by the National Low Income Housing Coalition to push for major expansion of rental assistance. But we know that you know, there are challenges here because there are people who are just watching rents go up, their incomes aren't keeping up, and we have challenges making sure, again, that the supply of housing is something that's going to really be important. I think one thing that's un important in all this conversation too is that you know we understand that landlords still have to pay a mortgage. They still have to pay property taxes. And the act taken today by Governor Inslee is going to help address people who are rent burden and landlords. But I will keep coming back to a talking point that you're gonna hear me talk about so much. We need to increase the supply of housing because we're not building enough housing to keep up with demand. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. Um, so next we have a question from Lindy and we had another constituent, Linda asked a similar question. So we're gonna group them together and this is gonna be for Craig. 
Um, Craig, they are wondering about the possibility of allowing tiny houses. So we know there are some tiny house communities um, in Thurston County, but they are specifically wondering about having them in the city limits of Tumwater or Tenino. Um, and particularly because they're flagging that they can't afford to retire due to the increasing rent rates that we've talked about. Well, it's a great question. And we're seeing some progress in that area. One is, Liz, you said there's a community of them, which is true. It's called Coyote Village up on mm -hmm. the west side of Olympia. And uh, boy, you're gonna have to fact check me on this, but I think it's 28 units happens to be one of the uh, properties that we help subsidize. And it required a HUD waiver, partly because of the size, partly because uh, the showers are up in a community lodge. And it was done because the uh, people who are being served kind of wanted that um, camaraderie of a common kitchen area, um, common area where they have private showers. And so uh, worked with HUD, HUD provided the waiver. Um, it's just worked out tremendously well. The residents when you go up there and visit them just are really happy with it. And then in the cities, and I think Lacey has really taken a, a big lead in this through a ADU, a, the accessory dwelling unit, they call them, um, that people can put on their single family housing lots. And Lacey took an extra step and they hired an architectural firm to design these. So you can go to the city of Lacey and they will uh, give you these plans. And as I understand it, there's a few modifications you can make, but if you select from these plans and the approved modifications, they're already pre-approved. So there's not a big permitting planning process that the homeowner has to go through to do this. And they're sharing this with the other jurisdictions. And so I, I really can't speak specifically to where Tumwater and Tenino are in the ordinances. Um, but um, I do know that all the jurisdictions are following that lead and, and looking at this option because it does provide not just for family members who might want to live there. You might have a brother, a sister, a parent, a grandmother, what have you, but just somebody who might want to rent the space and, and that can be done less expensively. The cost of buildings exploding and it's a whole bunch of reasons. There's not one single villain here we can talk about, but in an article in the Olympian the other day, they focused on cost and they noted that the Washington Housing Finance Commission said that to build the typical affordable housing unit, well, on your hat here, it's an amazing number, $247,000. And that is partly what's driving the rents and everything else. So um, the ADU can be done less expensively. A tiny house can be done less expensively than that. So it goes back to what the Congresswoman said, zoning um, permitting has to be changed in order to better accommodate that option because it's a great option for some people. Great, thank you so much, Craig. Mm -hmm. um, so Congresswoman, this next question is from Casey. Um, she's in Thurston County and Craig, you may also be able to help with this answer, but uh, Congresswoman, uh, Casey gave you some kudos. <laughs> she was saying, um, she's uh, giving you kudos about your diligence for creating a safe place for all to live and thrive. And she appreciates you. Um, but she also wanted to flag that she's you know, concerned about the um, growing homeless population in Olympia and uh, the crime, also the increase in crime. And she is asking why they've defunded the police versus funding accountability and leadership. Um, and what do you see as um, solutions to our immediate and near future? And lastly, she said, thank you for considering her question. And she represents a, you know, a population of hardworking middle-class Olympians that care about the homeless, mentally ill, uh, impoverished and marginalized, but just wanna know, you know what solutions can be put into place. Right, well, thank you for that question. And you're right, there are a lot of layers to it, but I just wanna start you know, talking about defunding the police and public safety. You know, here's the real debate. Every single person in every single zip code, regardless of their background, deserves to feel safe, period. And I think that that's something that's incredibly important for us to think about as we talk about what it means to have public safety in a community. With that said, you know, going back to the homelessness situation, you know, it's complicated. And if we had an easy answer, we would have resolved it a decade ago and the population wouldn't keep growing. But I still come back to the fact that providing a roof over someone's head, a place that is safe and decent to live is just one part of the equation. A lot of our neighbors who we see on the streets who have been chronically homeless for a long time, and these are the folks who you know, tend to have some 
bigger issues aside from just not being securely housed. And this is the need for wraparound services, helping people get back on their feet, all those things that have to happen. And what role can the federal government play to help supplement the work that's happening at the state and local level? And I say this again as a former elected official at the local level. A lot of communities simply do not have the resources needed to help the most vulnerable people who are on the streets experiencing homelessness. So how can the federal government play a bigger role and really make up for a lot of the funding that the federal government divested in for the past you know, 20 or 30 years? As far as you know, how we're going to add more housing, I come back to local land use. A lot of folks talking about you know, wanting to build more housing to help the most vulnerable, but then you get into a conversation about zoning in your neighborhood and people push back. And so we have to think about what it means to be zoned in your neighborhood to allow all types of housing for different people at every stage and every age of their lives. And also thinking about how we work together, public, private, federal, state, and local government. So I wish I could tell you there was an easy answer to this, but I will tell you that housing is just one component of what we need to do to help the most vulnerable people right now who are not securely housed. And I'm going to ask Craig if he wants to chime in and add anything to what I just said. Yeah, yeah thank you. My, my short add-on would be, unfortunately, some people will associate affordable housing with crime. I don't think Casey uh, is one of those folks, but uh, it provides the opportunity to, to mention this. Uh, one of the properties that we're expanding on as we're going through the permitting process, one of the public safety officials just made the offhand comment that we don't go there very often. There, there just isn't a lot of issues there. And back in the 90s, we purchased a property that um, had a lot of issues. It was the, reportedly the number one crime response call in all of our public safety response call in all of Thurston County. Uh, we worked with our internal housing stability staff. We invited the police to have a substation out there to help keep an eye on things. But just with attention to people and giving the respect and building the community, uh, the police vacated the space we donated to them after I think less than 90 days. And today that property doesn't have any more crime than uh, properties of similar size. It's a large complex with dozens of units. But um, the key point there is, affordable housing properties, even properties that are built for people who endure homelessness and move into it, uh, there just isn't the crime that the stereotype might suggest. People uh, may commit minor crimes when they're homeless because you have no place to go to the bathroom. So, you know, you, it's a, to get caught, I guess that's an offense. So it's sometimes that petty stuff, but once housed, the, the problems just aren't there when they're properly managed and a community is built. You know, and I want to add something too, Craig, um, you know, one statistic that we may not be aware of is between 2010 and 2017, for every one household that moved into our district, we were producing 0.64 units of housing in Pierce County, 0.76 in Thurston, and 0.62 in Mason County. So that gives you an idea of how the supply of housing available is not keeping up with demand. And this gap is real. It affects people's ability to stay securely housed, but it also deals with affordability. And again, coming back to the conversation about needing to increase the supply. Yep. Two or three and years ago, you know, Congress put out a report, millions of missing homes. So it's a problem yeah. across the United States. It's not a unique South Sound um, problem. If yep. we took Thurston Regional Planning Council data and extrapolated it, it would appear that we build about 600 fewer housing units of all types every yep. year and that's the way it's been for a decade and so it's a problem that's been growing and we we need to solve it indeed I want to just make sure sarah you can get in there yeah just to drive the point home you know i was looking up information in your district about where housing is and you know the connection between the housing crisis and homelessness it's it's the same crisis right so in your district for every 100 of the lowest income households these are households working low wages minimum wage jobs for every 100 of them, there are only 19 homes that are affordable and available to them on the marketplace, which means that the vast majority of them, 82, 81, 81 out of every 100, have no choice but to live in housing that they really can't afford. And they end up spending, of those households, 81% are paying at least half of their income on rent. And when you're paying that much of your money or your limited income on rent, it means that a broken down car, a missed day at work because you have a sick child, something happens. Uh, it's so easy for you to fall behind on your rent, face eviction, and in worst cases, become homeless. And I, I, you know, it is at its heart, it's both a supply issue to the Congresswoman's point, we need to build more housing, especially housing 
for people with the very lowest incomes. And we also need to increase people's wages. That's another piece I, I think that um, the Congresswoman hit on earlier with rental assistance. You know, housing costs across the country have gone up 61% since 1960. Uh, wage, sorry, housing costs have gone up 61%. Wages have gone up 5%. So there's this systemic market issue that is driving a wedge between what people have and what people can afford, which means that there's more homelessness. And so a combination of the Congresswoman's bill, greater investments in supply, zoning reform changes at the local level, increased rental assistance, those are the solutions to the housing crisis and to the homelessness um, crisis in your community and elsewhere. Well said, Sarah. Thanks. Yes, thank you so much, Sarah, Craig, and the Congresswoman. So we're going to go into the next question. Uh, Congresswoman, this is for you. And Sarah, we might actually ask you to chime in as well. Um, so Congresswoman, this comes. This question comes from Monica, though Tracy and Grady also wrote in on the similar topic. Um, so does your, they are wondering if your housing bill includes retrofitting existing buildings to LEED standards and ADA compliance. Um, Everyone kind of is noting that it's hard to find accessible housing. And for any new housing, will there be research for and inclusion for appropriate housing for handicapped persons? Okay, well, thank you for that question. You know, I remember um, during my time as mayor, we we're having a conversation about ADA compliance across the city, whether that's how we have curb cuts, the width of sidewalks, and how we make it easy. And when we build to ADA compliance, whether it is a home or even the outside built environment, sidewalks, roads, curb cuts, that benefits everyone. It's good for everyone. It is good for people who need it to function. It is good for young families with small children. It's good for senior citizens. So ADA compliance actually benefits a very broad swath of people. With that said, um, when it comes to um, retrofitting buildings with LEED standards, I think that there are a couple of things that happen. You know, whenever a building is being remodeled or being built from scratch, you have to go to the permitting department at the city and they really determine whether or not a permit is granted. So having those standards at the local level is one way to make sure that they happen. But I also want to raise something that was brought up in this question because we talk about building new housing, which is incredibly important, but we also want to maintain the stock of affordable housing that exists. And that's why you have agencies like housing authorities that want to buy up properties renovate them so they're more habitable and make sure that we're able to keep rents affordable for people. Because what's happened a lot in our market, especially in the South Sound, is that you have out-of-state developers coming in, they're buying properties that are in distress, they're renovating them, and they're putting them on the market for prices that are not affordable to people in the low income range. And so it's really a combination of policies that allow existing stock of affordable housing to stay affordable, complying with ADA standards and adding lead and ADA compliance into how local permitting is done. Yeah, I'd love to build on that. You know, this earlier this year, the National Low Income Housing Coalition launched a new campaign called the House Campaign where we're really focused on, you know, what are the long-term solutions that we need at the scale that we need them to make sure that everyone has an accessible, affordable, safe, decent home. And if we're serious about making sure that everyone has a place that they can call home, we have to be talking about accessibility um, because of the, because of uh, there's not enough units that are accessible. And because for a long time, the federal government hasn't required a high enough share of those units to be built in an accessible way. So we definitely support increasing that standard. That's something that can be done in this infrastructure bill that, um, for the housing investments that are in the infrastructure bill that are really important. And for um, greening housing, I think that's a big focus of, of Congress this year. Um, we know that um, climate change is a major focus of the infrastructure bill in general overall. Mm -hmm. And, and in every different sector, they're sort of finding ways, how do we advance um, a climate change through this bill? And on the housing side, there's a lot of focus on upgrading old systems, especially in public housing yeah. that were, you know, public housing was built decades and decades and decades ago. Not only does it face huge capital backlog needs in terms of roofs and boilers and other sort of systems, but it's also an opportunity to upgrade and green that public housing and make sure that it's ready for the 21st century. And hopefully that also brings down energy costs that are also burdening, burdening a household. So there's a real opportunity here with that infrastructure bill. I know 
I'm going to be doing everything I can to hopefully encourage Congress to get that passed and hopefully folks in this district will cheer on the Congresswoman as she does her part too. Thank you. Uh, great. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Congresswoman, the next question is from Carolyn um, and Cindy in our district also wrote in something similar. So they're curious as to your thoughts on how to incentivize developers to build low income and mod modestly priced housing. Well, that's a really good question, you know, and I tell folks that, you know, there's a reason that the public sector is primarily the builder of low income housing. And if you have the opportunity to be involved in some of these projects, it is a very complicated funding scheme. You work with banks, you take low income housing tax credit, you get market tax credits. It's a very sophisticated scheme. But we also understand too that, you know, we have to get more support from the development community to incentivize them to build more housing. There are often local rules that talk about, you know, if you're going to get a tax break, at least 20% of what you build has to be affordable. So I think more things like that. But then really, you know, having a conversation and sitting down with housing providers, with those who need housing, with those who are builders and figuring out how do we all get to this desired outcome of having more housing, a larger supply of low income housing and affordable housing. And I think, you know, as mentioned earlier, you know, the housing affordability equation includes a supply of housing. It includes what it costs to build housing. You know, Craig, I did not know it was $247,000 per unit now in the South Sound. That's outrageous. And, you know, I know in Seattle, for example, I think it's about $350,000 per unit. And so as you think about, you know, what that cost is to build housing, how are those who make the investment to develop the housing going to recoup their investments? And that's just a fact of life when it comes to what developers want to do. But again, this housing crisis that we are experiencing is hurting all of us. It hurts the entire economy. And it's just not good for us who care about people's livelihoods and the ability to be economically secure. So I think there's a conversation to be had with the private development community. And I'm very pleased that, you know, Marsha Fudge, who is now head of HUD, is a former mayor herself. So she understands the local challenges that come up when you're trying to build more affordable housing and working with her as a member of the Transportation Infrastructure Committee and working with HUD, breaking down silos and again, finding ways where we can make investments and just do everything we can to increase the supply of housing for low income residents and even I would say, you know, middle income affordable affordability. If, if I might add just a little to that, there is a group in Thurston County called Thurston Thrives. It brings in nonprofits and government folks and private folks that have worked on addressing a lot of issues, but this one in particular, the cost of housing. And there was an individual in particular from the private sector, his name's Zach Kostros, if I can dare use his name. I think he's proud of what he did. I, I think he should be. He created just, a, he's a Excel spreadsheet wizard. And he created something that was um, named the housing affordable mo housing affordability model, mm -hmm. and it outlined what does it cost to build a house. To the hard costs we can't control, like the skyrocketing costs of lumber, uh, local fees and taxes, and so on. This is what it costs to build, and then this is what it costs to operate one of these places. Costs around give or take a little bit, 500 a month just to pay taxes and insurance and utilities, basic operating expenses and some reserves to keep it a nice place. And so in Zach's model, the idea was, well, if I could have a break on operating costs or on construction costs, development costs, um, if I get a little bit of a break, then maybe I could offer a certain number of units in the development at a rate that's affordable to a given lower income level. And so it's made trying to take the emotion out of it and making it a little bit more objective, but just really quick math. If that average unit's $247,000, almost $250,000 a unit, let's say somebody be it grant or a private investor puts 25% down and you're financing 75% of that, that might be tax exempt bonds, that might be a regular bank loan. The difference isn't that great. Current interest rate environment rates are great, but the debt service, the payment yeah. on that amount of money is around, give or take a little bit, $800. And then if you have $500 for operating expense, well, you see where this is headed, you're now up to 1300. Mm -hmm. And you haven't returned anything on equity if it's a private investor. So just that kind of simple arithmetic helps explain why isn't anybody building affordable housing? It's a math problem. Yeah. And boy, if you've been over to Home Depot or Lowe's lately, you really see it in the lumber prices. They're up three, four times where they were um, a little over 12 months ago. Just stunning. Yeah, I'd love to build on that because that's exactly right. 
it is a math problem. And that's why it's so important to look at lots of different ways that you can lower the cost of building. One is through zoning reforms, like the Congresswoman mentioned before. If you make it easier to build um, more supply, um, less restrictions on, you know, some silly restrictions like in DC, at least height limits and minimum lot sizes and other things. Parking you know, that requirements. Just, parking requirements that just drives up the cost of housing that, you know, property owners have to take back in rents, right? So addressing those sorts of changes is really important to help facilitate the private sector to build more. But there's always this market failure at the very low end of the income spectrum. And that's really where, uh, you know, the local and state governments working with the federal government, working with developers have to come together to make that housing possible. And, and really, what we've seen is that in the last several decades, Congress really just, just hasn't been showing up the way they need to. Uh, we saw massive cuts to HUD's budget, for example, in the 80s, and we just never recovered. And that's why it's so exciting to see the Biden administration come in. President Biden ran on a housing agenda, um, expanding uh, supply and rental assistance to everyone who needs it. It was a core part of his, his platform. Secretary Fudge, as you mentioned, is a is uh, a real fierce advocate for housing. We're excited to have her at HUD. Um, but that's a big sea change from uh, the last administration. And I'm hoping that we'll uh, be able to use this next year and a half to really get as much done as possible um, to build that supply and to address that market failure. And in that way, we really can make sure that these investments in the infrastructure bill are transformational. We're not just building supply just to build supply. We're building it to tackle the underlying causes of the housing crisis. So we're building smarter and better for communities. And to, if I could amplify Sarah's point, at certain income level, it's impossible to build and have them pay yep. rent. You could have a project with entire equity, entire grant, like one of the low income housing tax credit programs with some state funds in there, like a housing trust fund. There's no debt in there, but you still have the operating costs. And take, for example, a senior. We, in Thurston County, sometimes it's easy for folks to forget this. We have so many folks with state, federal pensions, uh, but there's a lot of people who don't have that. They only have Social Security. Average Social Security checks 1,500 1, roughly. Yeah. And that means a lot of people are under 1,500. Well, if to cover basic operating expenses and reserves to keep the place nice, um, if people only pay a third of their income that they're paying so we'll say 500 ish um if you're making 1200 on social security you can't really legitimately afford that so yeah. uh, at some level um whether it's that essential worker that's around twenty thousand dollars a year the social security income only recipient there has to be subsidy for operating to um, keep these places good no and you raise a really good point craig i mean they're really does need to be have, there. There has to be some kind of subsidy, and I, you know, I will even tell the personal story of moving my, you know, seventy-five year old uncle from Portland, Oregon, up to the Tacoma area, and I was trying to find him an apartment to rent. And he's a retiree. He, you know, he worked for thirty years, and every landlord wanted his income to be at least four and a half times what what the rent was. And you know, again, you know, there are barriers that just make it hard for people to find housing. So. I know that it's a, it is a big problem, but I'm enthusiastic that we have people like you, Sarah and Craig, who are really working on it. And I definitely want to be a good partner with you at the federal level. Thank you, Congresswoman. Thanks, Sarah. And thanks, Craig. So we are getting a little tight on time. So I yeah. want to make room for our live questions. So I'm going to tee up the first question from Elizabeth. Um, she is asking Congresswoman, how do we ensure that we provide adequate housing that's integrated into our whole community so that low income residents are not marginalized or made invisible by putting such affordable housing out of sight? No, I think that's a really good question. You know, I looked to um, a Michael Mira, who's retiring from the Tacoma Housing Authority, and he was a big champion of mixed income housing. And that is such an important model to have. And Salishan was in shambles. It is a big housing development on the east side of Tacoma. But they basically created a model where they had the ability to own a home. They have renters of all income levels. And the thing that works about mixed income is that it has an effect on who kids go to school with. It has an effect on so much in a neighborhood and it helps build social capital. And so as we look at housing, 
you know, I like the model of mixing market rate with affordable as we look at rentals, but also just making sure that as we look at some of our single family neighborhoods, and if there is buildable land, which is at a premium in our district, we're finding ways to work with people in local communities and have them be more amenable to having apartment complexes or condos coming into their neighborhoods as well. And so, you know, when we, I tell folks that there's nothing more contentious than land use when it comes to politics, no matter what the topic. But if we're going to address this housing crisis and shortage and the fact that we don't have that much buildable land anymore, we're going to have to be open minded about letting different types of housing exist. And also, too, understanding that. What does it mean to be securely housed in Washington state in the 21st century? If you look around the world, multi-generational housing is not an uncommon thing. Adding accessory dwelling units, you know, adding different types of housing, even dormitory style housing for seniors, but being very innovative and thoughtful about how we can make sure that people have a place to live that is safe and decent and habitable. Thank you, Congresswoman. Sarah Craig, did you want to add anything to that? Well, Mr. Muir up there in Tacoma is a smart man, and we wholeheartedly agree with him in Thurston County. And mixed income does all the things the congresswoman said, and it doesn't create stigma that somebody says, I live in the projects or something that um, is not good for one's psyche. Uh, we, by design, don't have a big sign out in front of our properties that says Housing Authority of Thurston County uh, because we want it to be mixed and so you have a, a blending of people and the people take pride it's very immodest to me to say this but one of our communities was admittedly an unscientific reader poll but in the olympian um, it was voted south sound's favorite apartment community and i think i blow the socks off some people in the country who have an image of what affordable and what housing authority yeah. properties look like but we want people to have that dignity and that Absolutely. opportunity of living in a mixed community it also tends to ensure given the sad fact that in the United States, non-white, non-white, uh, non Hispanic um, people tend to be, um, have less income. And so if you want diversity in your communities, you want also the mixed income. Um, there, there's been a lot of racial profiling and housing development. So we want racial diversity, we want cultural diversity, we want income diversity in the properties. I think Elizabeth's question also goes to, I think maybe she, what she's getting at also is um, racial segregation in housing. So for a long time, federal policy, both in transportation and in housing, local policies created affordable housing just in concentrated areas of poverty or in communities of color. And those folks who needed affordable housing really didn't have a lot of options for where they could live. They didn't have the choice to choose what neighborhood they wanted to live in. Um, we know that racial segregation has huge impacts on things from education to your health outcomes to your ability to have economic mobility, huge impacts, right? And I think, you know, we certainly think that the federal government has a responsibility to help undo that racial segregation and how to make sure that all communities are communities that have access to good schools, transit, healthcare, good paying jobs, and that people have the choice to live where they want to live. And one of the things that's also in the in the um, infrastructure bill that we've talked about a little bit here is a real concerted effort to make sure that these investments are being deployed in a way that helps facilitate um, um, undoing of this racial segregation, increasing uh, choice for households, and increasing racial equity at the same time. And so part of that is building more affordable housing in those areas that have good schools and also working and concentrating resources to help revitalize distressed communities that have had resources taken out of them for so long. So it's a balanced approach uh, to try and make sure that every community is one of opportunity. You know, and I think another thing I wanna add to this too, cause you know, we're obviously focused on housing, but I even look at geographic equity as far as where we site high wage jobs. And we wanna make sure that people have the opportunity and they don't have to you know, make that commute up to Seattle or drive far away to get access to a good job that pays well. And so as we talk about you know, how we're looking at geographic distribution of jobs, I hope that we think about it in more in terms of equity so that we have this really nice economic ecosystem where people have opportunities to work 
in any skill set because there's dignity in all work, but that people get access as well. Because so much of what we talk about with housing, people often make decisions to live closer to their job and they get a place that makes them rent burdened. Thank you, Congresswoman. So I'm going to try to fit in two last questions um, that were submitted during this town hall. This next one is from Joseph. Uh, he is asking, um, he's saying our state has had a focus on affordable housing units through rentals. What we know is that home ownership is a huge indicator to many stability issues within all communities and especially with the success of children. Other than the support for grants that the Biden administration has introduced for the BIPOC communities, what is being done to address the missing steps in the home, home ownership staircase? First time home buyers are facing pricing in the high threes to low 400,000, sorry, just to start generational wealth building. How can we address this issue? Right, that is such a fantastic question. And thank you for raising the issue of home ownership and the wealth gap. We know that um, for black families, they have one tenth of the household wealth that white families have. And that gap exists with different communities of color. And so as you talk about the home buying question, I fully support what the Biden administration is proposing, which is a first down payment tax credit that's going to help families offset the cost of home buying and help millions of families actually put down roots for the first time. If you think about the legacy that African-Americans have had to endure from the time the Civil War ended and we were promised land grants but denied them, people were denied the opportunity to build intergenerational wealth. And that affects everything from your ability to buy a home, to get access to credit, to even pay for college. And so by supporting what the president is proposing with this tax credit, this is one way to do that. But we also understand too, you know, we want people to be successful renters so they can make that next step and have the credit history to become a homeowner. But I do believe that this administration especially is very dedicated to addressing the wealth gap. And that's gonna be through home ownership. It's going to be making these investments in infrastructure so that more people get access to high wage jobs. And also too, doing what we can to promote unionization so that more people have the ability to belong to a union, to bargain for rights and to bargain for better wages. So it's a combination of all these things. Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, the next question that was submitted this evening is from Michelle. She is, her question is about, sorry, I'm going to read this. Okay. Uh, how are we officially referring to the two infrastructure bills to distinguish them? Would you call the one announced today the bipartisan infrastructure bill and the other the human infrastructure bill? How would the Congresswoman quickly distinguish the two to help us message support? Um, and she thinks that her comment is also about this is an area of opportunity for us Democrats in common messaging. And Congresswoman, I know you have some opinions on that. So <laughs> I'll have, turn it over to you. <laughs> thank you. I have some very strong opinions and then I want my guests to weigh in here. So if I think about what it means to be a member of the Democratic Party in the United States, here's what we stand for. We stand for a nation that is safe, that is secure, and that is just. And we talk about safety and security that's about having our basic needs met. I mean, yes, it's about public safety, but it's the safety of having a place to call home. It's a security of knowing that you have a job. It's knowing that you're gonna be able to retire with dignity. So as a party, we do have this unique opportunity. As we talk about infrastructure, there are what I call the kind of like the two types. There's what I call traditional infrastructure, the roads, the bridges, and now we've added broadband and we've been talking about affordable housing. And then there's a very important part of infrastructure, which is called the caregiving infrastructure. And that is through the American Families Plan. And I say this because when we think about what it means to fully participate in the economy, we have to recognize that women have disproportionately been affected by the pandemic and are slower to return to back to the workforce. And a lot of that is the simple fact that women tend to be more responsible for caregiving for our youngest and for our eldest. So if we look at the way that we can promote people back into jobs, getting people back to work, we have to look at caregiving as essential infrastructure that helps take care of our children, that helps take care of our eldest, and really ensures that people can fully participate in the workforce. And so one distinction is the American Jobs Plan is about what I call traditional infrastructure, stuff you build. And then the American Families Plan is about the caregiving infrastructure that allows people to fully participate in the economy and get access to those jobs. Thanks, Congresswoman. Sarah or Craig, you want to add anything? I was just going to say, Michelle needs to start working for uh, for a member of Congress to help us with the 
with the communications mm -hmm. and the words around it. I get confused sometimes too, because it changes every day. We didn't know that they were going to strike this bipartisan deal until this afternoon. So um, anything Michelle says about how to divvy it up, I'm fine with, and I'll follow the congresswoman's lead too. Well, one of our programs, we work with folks, it's a program called Family Self-Sufficiency, and the participants set up goals so that they can move off of housing assistance and, for that matter, all other forms of subsidized um, programs that the federal government the state may offer and getting a job is certainly one of them they typically look for a primary care physician as part of that stability they look for some form of education that often leads to a better job but both education and that job a barrier is often child care and so if you'd like to see people progress and you'd like to see people off of subsidy and you'd like to see them becoming net taxpayers then you need to help them make those steps. Indeed. Okay. Um, well, it looks like we are ready to start winding down. Thank you everyone to, who submitted questions tonight. Um, and previously, we appreciate all of the inputs. And Congresswoman, I know you wanted to say a couple final words. Well, first, I want to say thank you to Sarah and Craig for joining me as part of this town hall. Again, I look forward to working with you and just being strong partners. And thank you to those of you who've tuned in today. We need your advocacy and your voice to make sure that we are passing the American Jobs Plan and that we're passing the American Families Plan. Those things are essential infrastructure to help us meet our basic needs. They're the things that are going to put people back to work, to house the most vulnerable, and make sure that this recovery from the pandemic is going to be equitable. And again, coming back to what Democrats stand for, we stand for an America that is safe, that is secure, and that is just. And from local government to state government to the halls of Congress, we all want to work together because we are in this together as partners. Whenever we can, we will work on bipartisan legislation. But absent that, we have things to do. The American people are depending on us. And so as a member of the Washington State Congressional Delegation, as someone who represents the 10th Congressional District, it is my honor to serve you. And again, my team and I never decided the fact that my job is to do here in Washington, D.C., everything I can to deliver for the people at home that I represent. So thanks so much. And let's keep up the fight to build more housing. Let's build housing near transit. And let's do what we can to make sure that this recovery is equitable and representative of all people. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Craig. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in tonight. Again, if you have questions or want to get your questions answered, please contact our office. You can do so at strickland.house.gov or call our Lacey office or our DC office or follow us or follow Congresswoman on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night.